That's fabulous to see all of you. As always, I hope you and your families remain well, healthy, and safe. Um, as always, I, I'm, we were talking earlier with Gavork earlier. I, I, this is extraordinary, what we are doing. An entire intellectual system and an educational system pivoted overnight to a fundamentally new modality of learning. And while it's been difficult and some things have been lost and some things we are not going to get to, to experience, and those are heartbreaking, uh, it is also true that this is, this is heroic. We pivoted overnight. We haven't skipped a beat. We continue to think at extraordinarily high and sophisticated levels. You guys provide produced midterms that blew my mind. Um, so we, we are continuing to survive and we're thriving. So just remember that as we keep getting deeper into this. Um, so, so it's great to see you guys, uh, as always. A few announcements and we're gonna launch right into chapter one today. Uh, so first announcement, uh, I sent the official prompt for the final exam. Did you guys get that? Yes. Good, okay. fabulous. In addition, I sent to you my lecture notes for chapter one from Rorty's Contingency, Irony, and Solidarity. Did you guys get that? Yes. Beautiful. <laughs> Someone just designated as the person who says yes. <laughs> I appreciate it. So that's great. So, so you should have the final, and you can start looking at it and print it out and have it with you while we go through these lectures. And print out the, the lecture notes, my lecture notes, so you can follow along. And, and um, if you miss something or I move something through quickly, these are resources to empower you to maximize the opportunity for you guys to thrive and, and get A's and come out of this stronger, empowered, become, become Nietzsche and all, a strong poet in this way. So you have the final. Uh, the final is due. Uh, Thursday, May 14th, so just keep that in mind. Um, you have the instructions on the prompt I sent you and you have the questions. Um, and as you know, this is standard sort of upper division class for me. We're, we're working through the final exam question directly in the lectures. Um, so try to do the reading, try to come to the Zoom classes and we will construct uh, the, the, mid, the final together. We will kind of create an architecture of the main ideas and what they mean and we'll try to put them in order and, and we'll move through it as we get closer to the final. So that's uh, that. Uh, the next, I'm going to go ahead and officially assign chapters two and three of Rorty. Uh, we're not going to go beyond chapter three. So the official reading assignment for Rorty is the four page introduction, chapters one, two, and three, and that's it. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and officially assign them. We're going to get into chapter one today. And depending on how far we get, once we're through one, maybe that's on Thursday, then we begin chapter two and we begin chapter three. So they're officially assigned. Go ahead and read them. Uh, and we'll get to them as we get to them. We've got five after today. We've got five lectures left. Uh, and that's plenty of time to, to do what we have to do. So we're under no time constraints. We're under no pressure. Uh, we've got enough lectures to do well and properly what we need to do, and we'll glide into the final in a, in a, in a good position, okay? So everybody know uh, what you need to read. You've got the final. You've got my lecture notes. Uh, everybody should have their, their midterm grades back. If you have not received your midterm grade, email me, um, but you should have them. So uh, any questions before I get started? or before we get started. And if you have your book, get your book out, because we're gonna work directly from the book today. We're gonna walk through chapter one and identify the core ideas and walk through this debate that Nietzsche has between a kind of nominalist account of language and traditional metaphysical uh, or foundational accounts of language. So get your book out if you have it. And are there any questions before we get started? Nope. All right. Let's do this. So, as we have been suggesting for the last several lectures on Rorty, we are telling this story. Rorty wants to sort of articulate this story um, of what he will call 
a liberal ironist utopia, what I have been calling, because that's a little abstract liberal ironist utopia, uh, what I have been calling a kind of postmodern liberal democracy, that that's the project in Rorty's book. And, and we have been structuring it in, in at least in the purposes of this class and our reading of Rorty, as trying to, to radicalize Mill's negative freedom and harm principle. Can, can Rorty make Mill's negative freedom, his, his Mill's obsession with individual freedom and the important work it does, can, can Rorty kind of push Mill's account of negative freedom and individuality and the harm principle. Can Rorty make that postmodern? And on the other side of the argument, can, can Rorty bring Nietzsche's aristocrat into the democratic political process? So can Rorty make Mill postmodern and Nietzsche a good liberal democrat? in a postmodern sort of way. And that's the project. Can we, can we create a postmodern liberal democracy? And what does it look like? And most importantly, how do we do it? What do we have to assume about language, about the self, and about the political space that will enable us to realize this vision of a postmodern liberal democracy? To realize this vision of making Mill's negative freedom and individuality and harm principle fully postmodern, what Rorty will call contingent, and how do we bring Nietzsche's aristocrat, this wild, creative, powerful, ambitious, poetic aristocrat, this name-giving, meaning-giving, value-giving renegade with the democratic social and political space. That's the project. Now, Rorty thinks that that project is possible. In fact, he, he, he thinks it's very possible. And he thinks, and he thinks as, and we'll see this in various ways as we get deeper into the argument, he actually sees this project as the kind of fulfillment, as the sort of ascetic and artistic fulfillment of, 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 of a variety of very important and powerful ideas associated with the Enlightenment that are already underway. In fact, Rorty would argue we're already well on our way to this postmodern liberal democracy. Uh, and we'll see what he means by that. So, so Rorty thinks this is possible. Rorty thinks we're already doing it in many ways, uh, in many really interesting ways. And the story Rorty tells us about how we're already doing it is truly, it's fascinating whether at the end of the day, whether you agree with Rorty or not, or, you know, uh, is, that's one thing, but the story he tells is, is truly in and of itself fascinating. And it's, and it's a worthwhile story to, to explore. So Rorty thinks that the creation of a postmodern liberal democracy is possible. That's his goal. He thinks we're already, <laughs> already almost there in many ways but he wants to explain to us how we do it. And, and we saw already, uh, when we talked about the introduction, part of the way to do that, the, what is necessary to begin the process of fully operationalizing and envisioning this postmodern liberal democracy is to, as we said, remember um, that for Rorty, it's important for us to separate our private lives and our public lives, and to acknowledge that all human beings uh, have both a private life and a public life. And while these two spheres or modes of life are equally important and equally present, they are incommensurable, Rorty argues, in the sense that the language, that the words and the meanings and the values and the purposes that we use to describe and cultivate and define our private lives, those words and words as tools and as metaphors, those words tend to be words that we use to create that private life and to animate that private life and to decorate that private life and to describe that private life. And the key thing about those words is that 
the words and the meanings and the, and, and the kind of private vocabulary we cultivate, Rorty says, as long as those words don't cause harm to anybody, and hence here is Rorty trying to make Mill's harm principle postmodern, as long as those words don't cause harm or incite violence to other people, Rorty says those words are not suitable to the demands of explanation or justification. As someone who is cultivating uh, this kind of, this private language, this private vocabulary of words and, and words that mean certain things and the way they describe myself and they describe the books I read and they describe the people I marry and the things I think and the, how I make love, those words that, that, that are sort of relevant only to this private setting, those words are my words, and, and I should be as free to choose and, and, and reimagine and stylize those words as I can be. In fact, for Rorty, that's the goal of life. But the key thing here is that those words are not susceptible to justification. If they're not harming anybody else, if they're not causing uh, or, or promoting violence or marginalization or harm to other human beings, then I'm under no obligation to justify why it is I listen to The Clash and not The Rolling Stones, or why it is I prefer Nabokov um, over other writers, or why I see Proust as, as meaningful in, in the project of this kind of dense self-creation. I don't have to explain that to anybody. And in some ways, we already, we already know that. We already kind of operate like that, even in contemporary liberal society we often say, well, it's, it's, this is what makes me happy. This is what gives my life meaning. This is what makes it rich and dense and artistic and creative uh, and valuable. And if you don't get it, well, you don't get it. So in a weird way, we're already kind of doing this. Um, and in Rorty's language, it, it, it sort of focuses on our willingness to see that language as, as, a, as a kind of language with its meaning and value that doesn't need to be justified. I, I shouldn't be under uh, and to explain to anybody why I think this way. And most importantly, I shouldn't be coerced by government or I shouldn't be coerced by other people um, to think differently or to listen to different music or to read different books um, or, or to, to, to live uh, in, in a different way. And so, so that vocabulary is private. And then, of course, we are also citizens. We are always already born. We're historical creatures. We are, we are all, every human being is born into some historical time and place, some cultural space. And for Rorty, the, the, our particular historically contingent social and sp political space is what we loosely call kind of late modern liberal social welfare democracy. That's, that's our historically contingent community. And, and, and we, are find, we find ourselves thrown there. We find ourselves kind of born and opened up and raised into important dimensions of our life that are truly public and that are political. And the key here, which is, again, I find this just fascinating. The key here is, is, is that the words that we use to describe the shared space, the public space, right? The words like freedom, the words like equality, the words like rights, the words like respect, uh, the words like economic policy, words like the distribution of scarce resources, words like elections, uh, words like institutions and processes, all this, these fascinating words that we have that one, open up how we conceive of and describe the shared public space. One, how, how is a shared space opened up in language, in a kind of vocabulary that by its very being, in terms of what the word is, what the word means, and how it relates different human beings, how, how, how is a public vocabulary, one, that opens this space, and then two, the purpose of that public vocabulary, words about freedoms and institutions and elections, and all that stuff, right? How do those words operate to help us negotiate a shared space, a collective space, right? And, and, and Rorty's kind of thinking of that is it's really brilliant. I, I think it's really fascinating. Now, the key to that from Rorty's point of view is not just that we have these words that open up 
a shared space, a political space, a common space. It's not just that we have words that do that, right? And that's their job. That's their tool. They're a tool to do that. And it's not just that they do that, but also on Rorty's sort of broader story about this, those words that we use to open the public shared common space. Not only do that's what they do in terms of that's their job, but because they open a shared space, because they're political and public, these words are by definition, by, by what Wittgenstein will, will say, the rules of the game, and we'll see Wittgenstein midway through chapter one, by the very rules of the game for the public words that first open the shared space, and then, and then the, the tool, the job they do as, as words that open shared space, the job they do is to help us negotiate how we live in that shared space together. Now, those words, Rorty says, are by definition, by the rules of the game, in this Wittgensteinian sort of way, those rules are by, those words are by their definition contestable. And those are the kind of words that we expect when we use them and we articulate them in a shared, common and public and political space to be contested. So hence, in liberal democracies, we have debates about freedom, about the limits of freedom, the, the, the boundaries of freedom. We have debates about the meaning of, of, of equality and the boundaries of equality and rights. And so, so the, the word tools that we use to open and establish the shared and common political space are words that by their definition and by the rules of the game are necessarily susceptible to justification. So if I if if I leave my private life, I, I, I leave my I put the I turn off the clash, I, I put on my you know my, my 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 public shirt and I put on my tie and I go out in the public space and I'm going to engage as a citizen in the public space in this this great debate, this great common political shared debate about freedom, equality, then the words and the way I'm using those words in that space are contestable. They are, they are susceptible to a very intense debate and contest. So Rorty wants to wants us to first recognize that that the, the, the metaphysical attempt to fuse the private and the public, to fuse private fulfillment with public and, and, and political purposes into one comprehensive medical metaphysical theory is not possible. We got to stop that game. We've got to see human beings as having two parts of their lives, a private and a public, that are equally important and happening you know, in different ways all the time, but are incommensurable. And they're incommensurable because the word, tools, meanings, descriptions that we use, the language, the vocabularies that we use in our private and our public life are different. They are word tools that do different things. Okay, and if you get if, if you kind of get that and you can start to roll with it, then all of this makes sense. All right, now so that's that's the project. We want we want a postmodern liberal democracy where we take Mill's notion of freedom and negative freedom and harm, and we make it postmodern and 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 we bring these Nietzschean geniuses, these creative poets, and and, and these artists, these artists and we make them compatible with the democratic and social and political space. All right, and Rorty thinks that that's possible. And as I said, he thinks we're already well on our way down to achieving it, actually. We'll see that in chapter three. All right, so how do we do that? How do we build that, right? And that's what we turn to in the first three chapters. As we turn to chapter one, chapter two, and chapter three, Rorty is going to walk us through a story. He is gonna walk us through a story about how we do that. And, and I'm gonna start using some Rortyan language, both in a playful way, because you gotta have fun with this, but also in an intensely serious way, because this is how Rorty's gonna talk about it. In telling this story, about how we do it 
And it's going to be t a story about how we conceive of language. It's going to be a story about how we conceive of ourselves. And of course, it's going to be a story about how we can conceive of the liberal democratic space. In telling this story about those three things, Rorty is going to try to redescribe his word. We'll see this later in chapter one. He's going to try to redescribe. And, and in redescribing, give new meaning and value and purpose to things that we are already in some ways familiar with, in some ways already doing, but now we're gonna look at it differently. And Rorty's quite sincere about this. He is going to try to, to, to tell the story differently. And in his words, he's going to try to redescribe familiar themes. And in, dis in redescribing familiar themes, convince us, try to seduce us. Is, and, and, that's, and that's literally the right word for Rorty, to kind of seduce us, persuade us into to, to seeing his story, to, to kind of being open enough to say, hey, wow, that's a really interesting way to look at things. That's a really interesting way to tell the story about language and the story about identity or the self or subjectivity. And that's a really interesting way to tell the story about liberal democracy. And, and, and Rorty, again, is, is quite sincere about this. This, is, this project, as, as he said at the end of the introduction, as he will say also uh, in chapter one, when we'll get there, in a few minutes, this, this process of envisioning and operationalizing and achieving a postmodern liberal democracy, it, at the end of the day, it's animated more by persuasion, more by a kind of seductive redescription of things, right? Then it is achieved by, well, I'm going to prove to you that this is a superior way to do it, and well, this is just what you need to do. Right, as he will say, and, and this is why I'm setting it up like this, as he will say, and again, it's a very controversial argument. People who are fully committed to metaphysics, they just pull their heads out when they hear this. But as Rorty will say in the middle of chapter one, this project is about redescribing language. It's about redescribing the self. It's about redescribing politics. And, and the process of redescribing is successful depending on how well it, it sort of seduces you and I into seeing it, right? It, it, it kind of seduces us into thinking, God, that's a, that's a kind of an interesting way. I used to think of things like this, but that's a kind of interesting way. I'm going to try that. And, and, and as silly as it sounds, for Rorty, that, that is really the deep kind of, the kind of energy that moves history forward, that, that people individually and cultures uh, on, in, in political systems at, at, at higher levels, come to redescribe themselves differently, and we'll tell that story. And so, so that's the story. And so, Rorty, each chapter is one part of that story. So, chapter one, Rorty is, is literally titled "The Contingency of Language," right? And Rorty's going to try to tell us a story about language and how, if we see language differently, we can do these interesting and creative and poetic things in our private life. And we can ultimately build these sort of social and political um, democracies where we have interesting debates about words that we share. And the second chapter, again, is the same title, not, not contingency of language, but the contingency of self. Chapter two is called the contingency of self. And chapter three is titled The Contingency of Language, I mean, of, of the community, of the political community. So there's a project here, okay? And, this, and, and each chapter is a, is a part of this broader telling of a story, of a redescribing language, a redescribing the self, and redescribing the social and, and political democratic space, all right? So, so let's start with chapter one, and let's talk about sort of Rorty's notion of language. Now, again, just to, to set this up, some of this is, is familiar to us. In, in some ways, um, in, in some ways, technically speaking, Rorty is very committed to a theory of language that we'll see that comes from Davison and especially Wittgenstein. 
And we'll see what he means by that. But in many ways, as we've already introduced him, Rory is a postmodernist. In some ways, he's a nominalist. Language is a human invention. It always operates as an assertion of meaning and value, and therefore as a kind of energy and power. And it's always changing. It's contingent. It's contested and is contingent. Um, so, so some of these ideas we've already seen with Nietzsche. Um, and of course we've seen them because we know that Rorty wants to make Nietzsche's aristocrat compatible with um, a private life and a liberal democratic space. So some of this will be familiar with us, to us. And so what I want to do is I want to walk you through the core moments of chapter one. Okay, so we, 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 can, we can pay attention to his language, to his description. Yeah. Well. Right, we gotta, we're going to walk through that, and, and, and then we're going to talk about what it means so we can understand what his project is. We can understand what he's trying to seduce us into. He's trying to persuade us. He's not trying to prove anything to us. What, you know, definitively prove that this is true, that this is correct. He's trying to persuade us. He's trying to seduce us into viewing language from a certain point of view. And he's going to tell that story by introducing a kind of nominalist, Wittgensteinian notion of language. And as he goes through chapter one, he's going to juxtapose his account of language with the traditional metaphysical and foundational account of language we tend to be more familiar with, right? So, so chapter one is, is very powerful, and in a way, it's very beautiful, uh, because Rorty's a great, great writer, and he, he has this ability to make potentially complex ideas very accessible. And so what we get in chapter one is Rorty's account of language as something contingent, nominalist, and, and he's going to juxtapose his account with traditional metaphysical accounts of language as he works through chapter one. That's a project. So we ready? All right. So if you've got your book, open up your book. Let's go straight to chapter one. And, and in, in, a, in, in a way that Nietzsche always opened up his, his essays, uh, you know, the, if we think about the genealogy of morals, the preface opened up with these bold statements. We are unknown. We, we, we men of knowledge are unknown to ourselves. Uh, in chapter one, you know, opened up with this idea of, of, of historians being unhistorical. Uh, in, in a very Nietzschean way, Rorty opens up his, his chapter one, interesting poetic observations, which tend to set the framework for the chapter. And, and Rorty opens up chapter one called Contingency of Language, again, with a kind of playful but, but serious observation. And, and he says, about 200 years ago, Rorty writes, the idea that truth was made rather than found began to take hold of the imagination of Europe, right? And this is, so, so this, so the project is ultimately, as we know, Rorty wants to convince us ultimately of seeing the truth as made, not found. That's when, when we think about, about language, when we think about the self, when we think about liberal democracy, when we think about all three of those things from a postmodern point of view, the, the, the project is to conceive of whatever counts as the truth. And we'll talk about how postmodern understand truth but but the project is to seduce us into believing that whatever it is we think about the truth of language truth as a product of language truth of our own life truth of the social and political space called liberal democracy whatever that is that truth and i'm using it in a playful way an ironic way um, whatever that truth is it's something that has been made it is something that has been made and constructed and invented by human beings. The truth is something that is made, not found, right? And again, right, that we, 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 we saw that, a version of that distinction in the Mill and Nietzsche distinction we, we articulated for the midterm. For Mill, the truth of the self is something that is what? It's discovered. The truth of the self is something that is found. Right and 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 Mill, in order to conceive of 
the truth of the self, what Mill called moral agency, or the superiority of certain forms of enlightened and elevated liberal democracies as something that is discovered as a progressive process, right? Mill said that requires a certain kind of language. You have to, and it, it assumes a certain understanding of mind, and it assumes a certain understanding of language, which we think we can equip ourselves that, that kind of gets into the content of our mind and in doing so connects with that truth, right? And, and so, and then Nietzsche in the genealogy more says, hey, the truth, the truth, the, the freedom that, that, that Mill thinks is necessary to find that true self and discover those progressive liberal democracies, that's, that's not something that is discovered. That's made, as Nietzsche said, the self is made. The meaning and the value, whatever your truth is, whatever Nietzsche's private garden was, right? Whatever, whatever Rorty means by that, that very dense and rich and creative and erotic uh, private vocabulary. That's something that is made. It's made by human beings, not found. And, and so Rorty gets us, gives us his own version of something we've already seen in Mill and Nietzsche. And he says, look, Rorty says, and he opens up chapter one, he says, about 200 years ago, and who the hell knows, maybe it was 205 years, maybe it was 210, doesn't matter, right? Rorty's telling us a story, right? He's trying to kind of seduce us into a story. And he says, you know, about 200 years ago, right, the idea that truth was made rather than found began to take hold of the imagination of Europe. And, and I want to stop here and I want to slide something in. Don't let me get on a rant. So someone in 10 seconds, someone pop in and say, get back, Daji. But I want to slide this in because, because the way Rorty is setting this up is not an accident. And while it is rhetorical, it's not rhetorical in the old sense. Rorty said after about 200 years ago, the idea that truth was made rather than found, and here's what I want to emphasize right now, began to take hold of the imagination of Europe. And, and, and this is, Rorty means this very literally. And we're going to see this as we get deeper into chapter one. But, but as we get deeper into chapter one, we're not there yet, so forgive me for jumping ahead, but I want to bring it up just because this, this, this strange phrase, began to take hold of the imagination of Europe. That strange phrase is literal in Rorty's, Rorty's meaning. History changes, literally. If Rorty was to, to provide an account of how history changes, he, and as he does in chapter one, we'll see this in a few minutes, he literally says, as he describes this, Slowly, over time, new ideas emerge slowly. They emerge privately in these private kind of sectors of discussions, right? And they emerge slowly. And they slowly begin to find public expression. They slowly begin to, to, to acquire public acceptance. And slowly, the imagination, uh, the imagination of a person, the imagination of an entire culture begins to change. We, 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 we slowly stop talking about things in one way, and literally, we, we stop talking about things with respect to specific word, tools, and descriptions. We specifically stop talking about things in a certain way, and we adopt a new way of talking about them, right? And this is a kind of gradual, sometimes punctual, sometimes intense, but most often a gradual process, right? And, and this is what Nietzsche, what Rorty is kind of gesturing at, even in this first line. About 200 years ago, the idea that truth was made rather than found began to take hold, it began to develop, it began to spread, it began to take hold of the imagination of Europe. And, and so, and this, and this is a story he wants to tell. And he says, and, and he says, and, and again, typical Rorty, he gives us two playful little examples about how that happened, right? And he said, the first way that this happened, the first way 
that this idea that the truth was made rather than found, one of the first ways of, of, of seeing that is in the kind of fanciful telling of the, of the French Revolution. It is found in his kind of poetic, fanciful retelling of the French Revolution. He says, look, if you, if you look at the French Revolution, right, if you look at what the French Revolution did, right, in terms of this idea that the truth can be made rather than found, he says, he says this idea that, that there could be an alternative society, this idea percolating in the minds of the French philosophers, of the Enlightenment philosophers, of, of Diderot and, and Rousseau and, and, and some of the Scottish Enlightenment philosophers, right? This idea that there could, this, this magic, this, this, what was first a, a kind of private, kind of unique idea that there could be a different way of organizing society right, in some sort of liberal democracy, right, based on freedom and equality and rights and respect for human beings, right? The, the idea that that, that that one could exist and not only could exist, but be operationalized and not just operationalized, but, but, but that idea, we can, we can make the truth, we can make a new society, right? Rorty says the rapidity with which that happened in a way, and, and, and the rapidity with which that, that moment of imagination overthrew the, what he calls the Ancien Regime, overthrew a thousand years of a kind of monarchical Christian political order. Literally, it, 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 it beheaded the king, right? The French Revolution, Rorty writes, almost overnight, right, sort of ended, it ended. Uh, a, a kind of monarchical, aristocratic, Christian worldview, right? And which had always asserted was true, right? And so Rorty gives this kind of utopian, inventive, imaginative reading of the French Revolution. He says, look, overnight, these French philosophers says, we can make a new world. We can make a new world. The world, the, the, the world that has existed for a thousand years of this aristocratic, monarchical, Christian back, Catholic back supremacy and oppression that we were told was true. We can make a new world. We can imagine, we can envision, we can make a new world. And Rorty says they did it. <laughs> and, and they literally did it in the guillotine. Right, Mr. Professor. And, yes. Sorry to interrupt. So yep. would this be saying that he's inserting uh, or providing us an observation, like the first observation into this new, um, like an observational view of the Enlightenment, like kind of starting to, to for us to be able to look at it this way? Well, I'm not quite sure I understand the question, Jennifer. It, is is this more of like a is, can we see this as an observational view? Like that's what you're saying, like that he presented well, this, this in this way by I, retelling I, I, the story. Well, okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm hung up on the word observational. Um, so you have to explain what you mean by that. Observational meaning that um, he's taking everything that he's seeing up to this point and throwing it back at us for us to be able to look at. In well, that way, let me look okay, at. So let me put it in a different. Let me let me okay. shift the angle here on this. I okay. think I know what you're going for. So, okay. so Rorty is saying, let me let me give you a poetic reinterpretation of the French Revolution. Let me let me redescribe how I want to think about the French Revolution. Is what he's doing, right? And he says. If you think about, he says, he says, in the story I want to tell you about the French Revolution, and again, this, this is not important. I want to make this point and get on, right? This is just getting into chapter one. But, but Rorty says, look, let me tell you, let me re-describe, or let me tell you how I interpret the French Revolution in the context of this idea that truth can be made rather than what? Found, right? That's, that's what he's talking about, that, that that there's, in the last 200 years, this idea that the truth is made rather than discovered, rather than objective, rather than metaphysical, rather than found, 
right? This is the core idea that Rorty wants to advance. And he says, and, and he says, and by the way, in my poetic redescription of things, let me tell you an example. A good example of this is the utopian visions of the French Enlightenment, right? Right, the, the utopian visions of these French philosophers, these English philosophers, these Scottish philosophers that in one way or another contributed to the fundamental changing of the world, right? Right, the fundamental overthrow of these aristocratic, monarchical, Catholic backed empires and dynasties that had ruled Europe for a thousand years. And Rorty says almost overnight, people, one, one, people were able to imagine a different world. Hobbes and Locke and Diderot and D'Alembert, and they, they were able to imagine a different world. They were able to create and invent and imagine a different world. They made it. They made a new world in Rorty's, Rorty's language. They invented a new world, a new set of descriptions of power, a new set of descriptions of human beings, a new set of descriptions of institutions. Right? They invented it. They made their truth. And they did it. So he's using it as a kind of playful but also serious sort of example of what he's trying to understand. About 200 years ago, the idea that truth was made, not found, began to take hold of the imagination of Europe. Right? That we can invent a different world. We can make a different world. And then two, the second way that this happened it wasn't just kind of in this philosophical sense, but he talks about the romantic poets. He says about the same time, he says, these romantic poets started to emerge um, in, in poetry and literature and, and also to in art in general, uh, that this, this new idea emerged that art was about self-expression rather than about imitation, right? And, and again, that's just a fascinating thing. And, and basically he's right. He's, he's giving a kind of interpretation of art history. And, and it goes something like this. Prior to the 1700s, prior to the early 1800s, prior to what he wants to call the romantic poets, but he's just using that as a, as a specific example. You can talk about this in painting. You can talk about this in literature, right? About this time, around 200 years ago, this idea that art was a means of self-expression, a means of human invention, of human creativity, of human self-expression, that idea that that's what art is, that idea started to emerge. And, and Rorty is making a kind of a playful but a very serious point that prior to that, Right prior to that, most as imitation. And by the way, he's right. And this goes all the way back to Plato. This goes back to Plato. And this goes also to the way New Testament Christianity understood art and the way art was understood all the way up to the kind of the Enlightenment, the 1700s. And, it, and again, very, very general term, but accurate term. Prior to this idea that art is something that humans make, right? It's made, and it's made to express creativity. It's made to express um, uh, emotion or feeling or, or private meaning. The idea that art is made to express private meaning or creativity or expression, that idea of art was new because before that, Art and good art was art that was technically in, in, in art history classes what they call realism, right? Art, art was art because it depicted in a realistic fashion what it was supposed to depict. So good art was a depiction of a forest scene and the trees looked like trees and the deer looked like deers or, or good art was a portrait. And, and the portrait looked like the person, right? Or in Christian sense, good art was art that, that kind of imitated the pastoral scenes or Christian scenes or scenes with Jesus on the cross or the mother or, or religious settings, 
right? Prior to this moment that Rorty's talking about where art comes to be seen as self-expression, as creativity, as, as giving meaning for the purpose of just giving meaning, right? That art was seen as imitation. That good art was art because it looked like what it was imitating in the natural world or in the Christian sense that art was a sort of imitation or manifestation of religious scenes or, or the Madonna and the baby Jesus and the cross. And, and that's what art was until modernity, until the middle 1700s, until the 1800s where, and by the way, this is where the art for art's sake begins. The, the, let's, the art for art's sake, right? This idea that will create art to make meaning, to give meaning. And that meaning can be whatever the hell you want it to be. It's an expression of your self-expression. It's, it, it is the beginning of a private vocabulary for you, a private, a, 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 the beginning of a private set of words and manifestations and creative expressions that, that, uh, that give meaning to you, to your life, or, or meaning to what you want the world to look like. And so Rorty says, look, around 200 years ago, the idea that truth was made rather than found started to take hold of the imagination of Europe. And, and he says, look, the French Revolution showed you how an entirely new utopian society could be made. They made it. They invented it in their minds and they made it. And at the same time, kind of paralleling with this, these romantic poets and these romantic writers started to think of art as self-expression, right? Art as self-expression. And, and these, and Rorty says in his playful redescription, right? In chapter one, on the first page, these two forces came together in a kind of very powerful way to begin this, and what we will now call fully postmodern, right? To begin this process that the truth is made, not found. And of course, whatever, Whatever, whatever it is that Rorty's postmodern liberal democracy is, in its entirety, in its conception of language, in its conception of self, and in its conception of the political space, that imagination, right, that vision is going to be something that is made and not found, right? And, and, and Rorty's goal is to seduce us into a way of thinking about language and the self and politics as something that is made, made well, made beautifully in many ways, but it's made and it's not found. And that's what he means by the contingency, right, of language, the contingency of the self and the contingency of the political community. So let's go to the next page, bottom of page four. Right, and Rorty, and Rorty begins to talk about this. And he's going to say, what does it look like? And what he does then is he's going to do two things, as I already said in chapter one. He's going to express what he thinks language is, is and he's going to try to seduce us into accepting this account of language. And while he does that, he's going to juxtapose his description of language with the more metaphysical and foundational notion of language we are familiar with, okay? And that's how chapter one moves. So on the bottom of page four, Rorty says, what was needed, right? This whole idea that the truth is made rather than found. What this set in motion or what this calls for, Rorty says, what is needed, Rorty says, is a rejection a repudiation, this is the goal for Rorty, a rejection or a repudiation of the very idea of anything, mind or matter, self or the world, as having an intrinsic nature to be expressed or represented, right? And this is, this is Rorty's postmodern description of getting of moving beyond metaphysics right rorty is going to say what is needed the first thing ultimately what we want to do and 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 what we have to do now to get to what we want to do the first thing we have to do is to begin 
with this idea that what is needed to begin this story, Rory's going to say, what is needed is, even if just for the sake of argument, right? Because at the end of the day, you can agree with Rory, you could not agree with Rory, and plenty of people who don't. But, but if, if we're going to listen to a story and we're going to follow the story, the first thing that we have to do, where does the story begin? It begins in an account of language, a nominalist, and as we will see, Wittgensteinian notion of language, it begins in an account of language, which says at the very beginning in this nominalist and postmodern way, what is needed is the repudiation of the idea of the old metaphysical or the old objective idea, the old foundational or metaphysical idea. What is needed is a repudiation of the very idea, and when he says very idea, he means metaphysical or foundational idea, the very idea of anything, mind, reason, Plato's notion of reason, matter, that the universe has naturally identifiable objective processes, that we can equip ourselves with the language and get in touch with those processes, right? What was needed was the repudiation of the very idea, metaphysical idea, of anything, reason, matter, the self, Mill's idea of the objectively true self, the world, the scientist's idea of the world, the repudiation of the very idea of anything, mind, matter, self, or world, as having or possessing an intrinsic truth, an intrinsic essence, a metaphysical meaning, a, an idea, an essence, a theological essence, however you want to think of it. What was needed, what is needed is the repudiation of the very metaphysical idea that anything like reason or matter or self or the world as having an intrinsic nature to be expressed or represented. And, that's, and so that's just the beginning of his critique of metaphysics and his introduction of a certain type of language. Now, to get into this moment, we have to have a, a discussion about a critical move that Rorty makes. How do we begin to have this discussion, right? And, and, and how does this help us understand language in a certain way? Now, to get into this discussion, right? To, to, to get in to this discussion, right? That what is needed is the repudiation of the very idea that anything, mind or language or the self or the world has an intrinsic nature that somehow we can discover, right? How do we begin to move beyond thinking like that? And he says, the first thing we have to do, and, and by the way, you've heard me speak about this in different ways at different times, and here's now where the, that has come from. Rorty says the first thing we have to do is we have to make a distinction, Rorty argues. We have to make a distinction between two claims, two, two very powerful claims, and the way these two powerful claims got connected in the history of metaphysics. We have to make a distinction, Rorty says, between two claims. One, right? between this claim that the world is out there and the second claim that the truth is out there. Rorty says we have to delink those two claims. We have to make a distinction, a distinction between the claim the world is out there and the truth is out there. This is the first move into this postmodern project. We have to make a distinction between the claim that the world is out there and the truth is out there. Now, metaphysics conflates those two claims. Metaphysics, in one way or another, says the world's out there and the truth's out there. God's out there, the truth's out there. Plato's idea of justice is out there and the truth's out there right? Metaphysics brings those two arguments together, 
The world's out there and the truth's out there. And Rorty says the first thing we got to do to repudiate this idea that anything has an intrinsic nature is to we'll start here. We've got to make a distinction between two claims, that the world is out there and that the truth is out there. And now we're on the bottom, we're on page five, and it's a really powerful page. And he says, okay, so let's start, let's start with the first claim, the world is out there. Right? And if you've had the tragedy class with me, and you, you're, we're familiar with this, and we were even in some ways have had an opportunity to talk about this in this class. For Rorty, for Nietzsche and Rorty, for nominalists and for people who are committed to a kind of Wittgensteinian notion of, of language as a game, right, to say that the world is out there, right, for, from a Nietzschean perspective, to say the world is out there, from a Foucaultian position, to say the world is out there, from a Wittgensteinian position, to say the world is out there, is simply to say this, Rorty, and Rorty, this is what he says in the book, to say the world is out there, is to say, Rorty says, here we go, and you've heard me say this before, here it is again. To say the world is out there is to say that there are all sorts of things, out things, literally physical extant things, and processes. There, and, and there's probably billions of things and all sorts of processes out there. To say that the world is out there is to say that there are all sorts of things and processes, here we go, that are the effects, that are caused, that are the effects of things that have nothing to do with human states of mind. Let me repeat, it's, it's a very empowering thing from a certain point of view. To say that the world is out there, and, and Rorty even says, is to say in a way commonsensically, right? To say that the world is out there commonsensically, Rorty says, is to acknowledge there are probably billions of things. There are probably billions of planets. There are planets and exoplanets, and, and there's probably all sorts of fish in the deep ocean we haven't seen, right? We haven't encountered. There's probably all sorts of processes out there. There are all sorts of things and processes that are real, that are real, that are extant, that are real. They're not, they're not, this is not a head in the jar argument. They're not, they're not figments of our imagination. There's an external and extant world out there filled with things and processes. And all of those things and the processes are effects of causes that have nothing to do with human states of mind. So as we've talked about in the tragedy class, so for Nietzsche or for Foucault, or maybe even now in Rorty, things are real, things can be real there. And if you want to think of them as real, that's fine. There are processes out there that are real. But those things and those processes are the effects of causes that have nothing to do with human states of mind or language. So things can be real, but that doesn't mean that they are true. Things can be real. And by the way, things can be real, but not true in two ways. Things can be real and not true because we haven't discovered them yet in a weird way, right? There, there are things that we haven't encountered. And because we haven't encountered them, we haven't described them in language. We haven't invented a word tool that describes this. So they're real and they're out there. Who knows? All sorts of processes, they're real, but they exist. But in and of themselves, they don't have meaning. They don't have value. They don't have purpose. And they can't 
have meaning or value and purpose because they literally don't have a word. They don't have a word tool invented by people who are somehow in some way encountering them thinking, holy smokes, what the hell is this? How, how, do I, how do I process this? I don't have a word or a tool that describes this. Now I've got to invent a word tool to describe this. So those things are real and they're out there. And those processes are real and they're out there. And they are the effects of causes that have nothing to do with human life, with human mind, with human language. They're real. But in and of themselves, not only are they real, but in and of themselves, they don't have a word. They don't have a definition. And therefore, they don't have meaning. That's what Nietzsche means when he literally says, in and of itself. The cosmos is real. For a billion years, the sun rose in the east and it set on the Malibu Ocean. For a billion years. And it does so because it's the effect of causes. Maybe we have some idea about, maybe we don't. But, but it doesn't rise and set. And that has nothing to do with human mind. And the rising and the setting, the meaning of it and the value of it isn't intrinsic to it. So things can be real. Of course, Rorty says, to say the world is out there is to say with common sense, Rorty says that there are all sorts of things and processes that are real. They are the effects of causes that have nothing to do with human states of mind or language. So things can be real, and they are, I suppose, but in and of themselves, they don't have a word. They don't have meaning, they don't have value, they don't have purpose. That is something that humans give them in language as a way of describing an encounter with something. To say, so top of page five, to say that the world is out there, Rorty says, that it is not our creation, Rorty says, is to say with common sense that most things in space and time, most things in space and time, all that extant stuff out there and all those processes out there, are the effects of causes which do not include human mental states. Okay, okay, so, so there, are, there are things out there. You could even call those things real. But those things and those real things don't intrinsically, in essence, in, in intrinsically have meaning. And certainly not a word that, that, that somehow is, is expresses or reveals their essence. They don't have a word that somehow magically re reveals their process. And again, that's what Nietzsche means. In, in and of itself, the world is fundamentally without meaning or purpose. It's real. Those things are outside are prior to, are indifferent to human meaning until humans give a meaning. Right? The, the, the sun rises in the east, it sets over the, over the, over the, the Pacific Ocean and, and over, the, over the beach in Malibu and you sit on the beach and, 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 it, and, and, and it's beautiful and it's romantic, right? And it has meaning, it has beauty and value, romantic value, all of that is a construction. All of that is a construction, an important construction, a beautiful construction. Nothing makes me happier than to sit on the beach with someone I love at sunset and pop open a bottle of champagne and sit there and say, wow, I'm so in love with you. You make my life so meaningful. Look how beautiful this beach is. Can you believe that sunset? How romantic. I want to spend the rest of my life with you. Don't ever leave me, honey. Favorite thing in the world to do. Okay, cool. 
but that is clearly from this nominalist moment, human beings giving a name, sun, giving a meaning, beautiful thing, romantic thing, giving it a value. It's, that's humans inventing and imposing meaning on things and processes that are the effects of causes that have nothing to do with human mind. It's human mind imposing meaning and value and beauty and purpose on things that are real, but in and of themselves don't have that meaning. Okay, and then Rorty turns to the second. You gotta disentangle the statement that the, the world is out there from the statement the truth is out there. So we turn to the second, top of page five. To say that the truth is not out there, he says, to say that the truth is not out there is simply to say that where there are no sentences, there are, there is no truth. That sentences are elements of human language and that human languages are human creations. So the truth can't be out there because there's no language out there. There's no, there's no, nature doesn't have a language. The cosmos doesn't have a language. There's no language out there. There are things and there are processes that are the effects of causes that have nothing to do with human mind and language. But there's no language out there. To say that truth is not out there is simply to say that where there are no sentences, there is no truth. That sentences are elements of language. And human languages are human creations. Truth cannot be out there. The world is out there, but truth can't be out there. It cannot exist independently of the the human mind because sentences cannot so exist or be out there the world is out there but descriptions of the world are not right language words meanings definitions and values words and language they are they are human inventions they are tools and they are tools designed to describe the things that are out there, the processes that are out there. So the world is out there, but descriptions of the world are not. Descriptions of the world are human inventions. And they are human inventions because language is a human invention. The purpose of language, of words and definitions, is to signify and describe that thing. And doing that, inventing the words and the meanings of the words and the way those word tools operate as tools of description, those are human inventions. That doesn't happen anywhere in the world. That comes out of human mind. Truth cannot be out there, cannot exist independently of the human mind because sentences cannot so exist. They can't be out there. The world is out there, but descriptions of the world, only descriptions of the world can be true or false. The world on its own, this is what I meant earlier by saying in and of itself, it has no essence, it has no meaning. And this is what Rorty says, the world on its own, unaided by the describing activities of human beings cannot have meaning. So again, the world is out there, but descriptions of the world are not. Only descriptions of the world can be true or false. The world on its own, Rorty writes, unaided by the describing activities of human beings cannot. Okay, we're gonna stop here. And then we're gonna pick this up on Thursday and we're gonna really push deeply into this argument. You guys good? All good. Good. Love you guys unconditionally. Thank you, Professor. And, um, Thank you, Professor. Yep. Yep. Thank you, Nick. Love you guys. And um, good job today. And I'll see you on Thursday. Okay.